Hey everyone, welcome to Wellness Radio. Today we have a very special episode. Um, obviously my wonderful, awesome, incredibly funny co-host, Liam, is not here today. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to spend more time with an extra special guest. Her name is Esther and she's from Apara? Aparaba. A- Aparaba. We're going to learn all about Aparabar and conscious conception, which is a topic that I was not really familiar with. And when Esther and I uh, started talking, we had this full on, I don't know, hour and a half conversation, wonderful conversation. And this woman has so much information that she is going to be sharing with us. So welcome, Esther. Thank you very much for joining us today and for flying from Brisbane, is it? Sunshine Coast. Sunshine Coast to join us here on Bondi Radio, and I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. I look forward to talking to you and with you. Yes. So I think normally I would ask you, how did you get to the path of your business? And, you know, there's a certain structure that we go through with the guests. But I think because this topic is so unique, and I think because we need to bring the audience up to speed with what we spoke about, I think we should start from the beginning, and literally the beginning. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the beginning starts with your story, but then what you've learned through your story, and then how this story kind of applies to your, your yeah. business. So. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I, look, I'm just one of many women who are facing reproductive challenges, and that really put me on the line to understand more about what sits there in fertility. One in, us, in six, Australian couples face infertility and fertility challenges so I was one of them and it was a long road that started you know with reproductive challenges and trying to figure out what to do and the medical you know the the doctors just didn't have answers their answer was to put you on the pill to manage your cycle to manage your reproductive system and are completely disengaged to what it means to be a woman, what it means to deal with your whole reproductive system, what it is. So when we lose touch of our reproductive system, we actually lose touch of um, our conception journey because these days, you know, we used to live in expanded families where mm-hmm. that whole journey of becoming a mom, becoming a dad, um, and, and having that rite of passage into adulthood into becoming a woman into becoming a man Mm. from there into becoming a parent was all lived in it wasn't a a separate space right it's all part of a journey we do as a family Mm, mm. can i ask how long were you um you know trying to conceive and how long were you researching this look to be honest my reproductive challenges um started with endometriosis polycystic ovaries painful periods, uh, chronic pelvic pain. Mm. So I had bursts, I had surgery. So it actually started with that, Mm -hmm. trying to get healthy and realizing the medical industry couldn't help me. And when I was 22, a gynecologist said to me, you'll have a hard time to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. You know, your ovaries are too full with cysts. You know, it's gonna take a while when you're ready. Wow. And you should start it early because you might have a difficult time when you're older. Wow. So that, and that implanted in my brain, naturally. And I was like, you know what? Do I want to go there? You know. So y- are you saying that you didn't really accept that and you forged through with your own journey? Um, yeah, so um, I... I mean, because I've heard you're not the first person that said the people in the white coats have told me one thing. There's no hope. I don't have a future with... A baby yeah so so it was really um, a, a whole spiritual understanding so I ended up walking a real strong path with uh, from sweat lodge medicine to Peruvian shamanism to Reiki mm-hmm. that really unraveled and showed me belief systems that were held in me mm. um, that already my family held and my ancestry held right. and that needed to shift so that was one part And the other part was, by the time I was 27, I was ready to hear that my disconnect to my whole reproductive cycle 
was interlinked mm. with my reproductive challenges, wow. right? And so then I met an incredible woman, um, Andrea Fernandez. Mm. She does um, the Vigo therapy of main abdominal therapy, and she's fantastic. So it, she changed my life and really inspired me and empowered me. So mm. she was the first time a practitioner that rather than saying, you know, here's the magic pill, you got to come to me every week and I will make you better. Mm. She was actually saying, okay, here are the tools, so you make yourself better. Wow. Okay. Empowerment. It was so inspiring that I realized I was dead scared of being pregnant because mm. I knew nothing about it, only what the media is telling me. Right. right? Mm -hmm. I realized I was scared of ever becoming a mom because I saw it, you cannot live your own life through it. I had so many internal judgments about the weak mm. female mm -hmm. and so many fears about pregnancy and birth that I did not even realize I held. Like someone really had to put my nose into it to realize I held fear. Wow. So that put me on a journey to go like, you know what? If you have fear, just jump into it. Like really jump into mm. it, face it mm. and, and learn what you want to learn. Mm. So that's why I became a doula, and mm -hmm. that's why I became a main abdominal therapist mm -hmm. in order to face my own fears. Mm -hmm. And that's when, through witnessing clients and witnessing the whole process and witnessing in myself, that within three years, mm -hmm. three years, right? By that time, I've had uh, surgery on my ovaries. I had mm -hmm. 15 years of reproductive challenges, and it only took three years of self care. And I was symptom free. Symptom free, right? So did you do did you do mental work and physical work and diet? So what Everything. first okay, so I have a couple of questions. So do you think the fear that you held in your body is what prevented you from becoming pregnant? Everything, yeah. Okay. Um, absolutely. Fear belief system. The first story you ever hear about pregnancy, the first story you ever hear about birth, yeah. whether it's your own or someone else's, has a major impact right. on what you hold and subconsciously hold in your mm. body, has that stress. Yeah. What other things can prevent pregnancy? There's so stress, much that toxicity, toxicity of our life, yeah, really. So, right, so okay. modern life. So number one, we don't have space in our lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I get so many clients who are such great achievers. They have an incredible life. They mm. should be super healthy. They yeah. shouldn't have reproductive challenges, yet they don't conceive a child. Why? Mm -hmm. You know. And if you look at research, 40% uh, a woman is less likely to conceive by 40% if she's in stress. Yes. Yeah. So if you if you think about that, stress has an impact. So yeah. the toxicity of life and not having the space, and then the toxicity of our environment, of living, right. of everything. So there's a, a mental an emotional component yeah, yeah, and yeah. a physical component. Yes, right. And and do you think that there's a maybe a, a higher spirit that is in play and, and knows maybe when you're right to have a baby and maybe it's not your path to have a baby. Maybe your path is fostering or maybe your path is you know, adopting. Yeah. And so does a bigger picture or a bigger force at play? There, there's a huge force. I mean, this conception goes way beyond the egg and the sperm. Mm -hmm. Way beyond it. Okay. Like there is, when, when you witness um, a woman, like I, I could see with every client coming to me, whether there was a spirit baby or not hanging around. There's like, there's a whole nother force of energy that we can tap into, that mm. we can make connection, that we can call in, and that can help us to actually surrender because we have our timeline, spirit has a different timeline. Yeah. We have soul contracts, and this is a whole nother uh -huh. topic. We have huge soul contracts with the, with the beings that incarnate, and mm. when it's their time, and how it's their time, and what environment is right. So there are actually a lot of tools that we can use to really connect with the spirit baby mm -hmm. and actually learn to listen and rather than make it my timing and mm -hmm. what's right for me right now, so move out of ego and want yeah. into trust and communication and listening, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a whole nother ball game. Wow. And what that changes when we make this huge connection, I've done that with my daughter. Um, she dropped in a year before I conceived her. The spirit was ca just came and bang. We had this conversation for a year going on where I created space, where I followed her guidance oh. with how to deal with my diet, how to deal with 
what nutrients will support her, what lifestyle, what exercise. She actually guided the way and she told me the exact day she would come in. Oh my she God. gave me her name. And you know, it, and, and then all that came true. All that she was conceived on the exact date that she has given me. Um, she just she was that name. She was always she told me. What's her name? Leilani. Oh wow. And she told me she was gonna be a girl, and she was a girl. She like everything. All I needed to do was listen, mm. and I needed a husband that trusted me to listen and to go through a process that we went through together. You know, this it is a partnership. You know, you're not gonna do it alone, and yeah. that's the that's the magic yeah. and the bond that facilitates when you make contact preconception with a child. That bond goes through pregnancy. Mm. You know, you can really then in pregnancy just connect quicker to your child. You can connect quicker and really get the messages. Are you okay about? Okay. You know, what do you need? What does my body need? What will nourish you now? How, you know, you can connect and mm. they'll support you through birth. They'll support you postnatally. Like, you know, my child ended up having colic and my connection with her actually was able to find affirmations mm. and other treatments that were in alignment with what she needed. Mm. And it worked. Were, were you freaking out a little bit that you've got your, your, your baby speaking to you and, and guiding you the way on how to live her life? It's no, such a wonderful, I, I, was, I was really, really beautiful, excited. Beautiful. Like, I'm, I'm speaking with spirit all the time. Yeah, and I okay. witnessed by that point, I witnessed so many clients coming through my yeah. door. And I knew, I always knew when they had a spirit baby around. I never knew when exactly their timing was. It wasn't my, my place to be. And I actually personally believe it is not the place of a seer or a tarot reader to tell mm. you who your spirit baby is, what its name is, because it detracts, it disempowers from you having that experience, mm. you yeah. accessing that information. It detracts from that bond and anyone you don't have to be a seer to have that connection you just need to know what is my modus of receiving information mm. is it through feeling is it through knowing is mm. it through dreaming yeah. is it through you know yeah. what is my modus of writing which sense can this child access the most wow okay so let's talk about that let's talk about um opening the space for your child to come in and communicate okay yeah. so does this happen before the 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 two people come together and have a fun time in the bed or <laughs> look you, you can do it actually at any point yeah. in your life as a woman yeah so, so and, and the man can do it too yeah right okay. so it's um there are different stages, stages. of okay. that so it depends where you're at in the life like i've had clients come to my workshops who were just young women who at some point in their lives knew they wanted to have children. They still did the exercise that I ran them through mm. to make connection to that spirit child to open the gateways, but also to trust in the unfolding and that line of communication that when the time is ready, that line is open yeah. and the communication is there. Yeah. When I do it with couples, it's beautiful to actually start that connection between them and bring that connection up yeah. and and start that channel right and then you once you know how to practice it you can practice it bet, you know before you make love if, if if you're so inclined or just after you made love or, or whatever wow. you choose to do you can do it as a daily exercise to mm. just but you got to make room to listen not to listen for what you want to hear, yeah but yes to listen. yes it's funny because you're right when 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 you get into pregnancy mode you're looking at the calendar you're looking at the time you're like you're you're constantly looking out and you're not looking in and um, I think that's a really interesting uh, perspective so what you're saying is actually con conceiving can start with a woman even before she meets yeah. her man. Yeah. And so is that what you encourage women to do? Is to, to start, if they think they want to have a baby, that might be the first sign? In utopia, like you can even talk and communicate to that child to actually bring, um, help you bring a, a witness and see and be open enough for that man to come into your life. Wow, wow. So which means because sometimes um, I see a lot of women have the big tick list of what the man needs to meet and which means it's again the narrow focus that doesn't allow them yeah, right. to stay open to what spirit actually has planned for them which is way more amazing than they could have imagined. 
Yeah. You know, and um, so when you make that connection, and you, you can actually talk to her, you're like, let me see your father mm -hmm. when the time is right for you. Uh -huh. You know, so it is a tool that you can utilize. So all of this is actually to actually realize your co-creator. Yes, co-creation. Right? It's co-creation. Mm. That's what I witness with a lot of my clients in the tunnel. So when we get into that tunnel of conception, where nothing else happens, we're looking for the magic pill. You make me pregnant. It can only happen that we know nothing else in life happens anymore. But that causes, that sets us up for disempowering ourselves, handing over the power to someone outside of ourselves for them to make us pregnant. You know, especially when we go on an IVF journey, the whole power is held by the therapist or by the doctor. Right, right. But it's about how can we do a co-creation here and still be an empowered point of this yeah, journey. Yeah, that's right? interesting. Yeah. Can I ask, do you think, and this might be controversial, I mean, I know that IVF has helped a lot of people and it's a beautiful thing because there's a lot of beautiful people on this world because of it. But do you think in a way that that's uh, silencing a spirit baby? Because there might be reasons why people aren't getting pregnant for the reasons that you were talking mm. about, stress, and you know, that's not fair for a baby to come into a life that's already stressful, but if you force something that makes the lady pregnant, it's almost not really honoring. I actually have a very controversial point of view on that one, I think, because um, I do believe um, the way we are conceived creates a blueprint of our makeup energetically. Mm -hmm. So if a child is conceived through technology, it holds the frequency of new technology, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which can be fantastic mm -hmm. if held in love. Yeah. So if the process by the clinic and by the parents is held in love and not in fear, that being can create remarkable futuristic yes. technologies right because it's running through its system yeah and this might be really out there for some no, of you it makes sense to me you know? absolutely um so i think um there we really have to look at what is our makeup you know and we are if you start looking to the science of water water and energy you actually notice like that water holds memory and water responds to positive emotion and negative emotions mm -hmm. to positive thoughts and negative thoughts to um, you know the environment to energetics so water holds that memory and responds to that now an ovum and sperm is pretty much 95% water so you got to really think about that so it means the environment in which the ovum and the sperm are met together has a major impact in the imprinting of that cell tissue. And you can do an experiment at home with mm. water. You know, you can have a jar that says hate and a jar that says love and and water two different plants yeah. with it and actually see what happens. Yeah. And the same happens to your beautiful egg and sperm in a Petri dish. So it's like, can you get your fertility team on board to create a, a place of connectivity and honoring that this is a sacred moment where sperm meets egg whether it happens in a petri dish or between two yeah. people in a body it is sacred it's a profound moment that fuses and you know there's a light explosion so if it happens in the body wow. of a woman you know they have filmed it they've actually seen it happen when egg meets sperm there's a zinc explosion in the body, a major light explosion, and that is when, you know, spirit creates life. You know, it, it, it is remarkable. There's a light explosion in your body. Wow. So when you bring that sacredness mm. to a petri dish, you know, then I'm not, you know, then I'm all for it if it's held mm. in a loving, supportive environment. But the problem that a lot of women and couples go through mm. is they're feeling like a number that is just churned through, yeah. that is, you know, li they feel like that Petri dish that is not really respected, mm. right? It's yeah. and, and that's where the grief comes in. Oh, I'm actually getting really emotional yeah. because it is a really painful and emotional journey with so much grief and hope and smash hope. and. You know, that IVF journey is so painful mm. for a lot of couples for years. 
and I feel they're not being held through that process mm. with the major emotions and I feel very disempowering. Right. Wow. So if it's held in a loving and empowering sense, mm. you know, it's a, it's a very different energy. Yeah. So I don't have a black and white answer. Yeah, there, no, you, but you that's know? really, really beautiful. And, you know, I have heard stories of friends who've gone through the IVF process and that the they don't do that. They don't hold it in that beautiful state that you talk about. You are just a number and all they see is dollar, dollar signs at the end of it. So it's almost like uh, when I'm thinking and I'm hearing my friends stories, it's almost like they're doing this just to make money. They're making mistakes just to make money. They're not honoring that big white flash that you talk about that um, they probably don't even know. It happens, yeah. so it's really clinical, and I, I and I, 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 yeah, I'll keep my thoughts and opinions to myself. But can we go back to the water element? Yeah. Um, how important is clean water in the conception, like the the the, the filtered water of? Uh, do do people who are trying to get pregnant through IVF know that filtered water is really important? To put to get that environment safe for the the sperm and the egg. I I think that's again a, a place where. There's so much information actually missing in uh, in the world out there right now, and that is um, all the other elements that affect. There are great little um, documentaries out there. I can highly recommend, for mm. example, on Gaia TV that are on water, and the incredible work that people like Masaru Moto have done. Water is absolutely important. Our bodies are 55 to 75 percent water, mm. right? So. It holds and retains memory, mental, emotional. It is so affected by the music we hear, by mm. the words we hear, by the words that run through our own system. The tattoos we wear. Wow. You know, are they positive? Are they negative? And that's a whole nother story. Yeah. You know, I love tattoos. I actually love them. They're so beautiful. I haven't got one because there is no. I haven't found a natural ink yet. You know, and the lead and. Um, a lot of the adjacents um, and the preservatives and, and a lot of the ingredients that are, for example, in tattoos and inks can actually overburden the system, particularly the research shows if it's more than three relatively big tattoos, they have an impact on your lymphatic system. Wow, so okay. science co catches on, on the end, it actually can disrupt some of your endocrine system. Wow. So there's research out there now that supports this. Mm. But if you think about the energetic element, if you have, you know, death or negative um, tattoos on your body oh, or, wow. or tattoos that hold a negative memory, that is imprinted wow. on you. Right, so if you look at water and memory, and water being impacted by memory and by words and by images and by sound, and then you, you, you feed that back into your body's being 75% water, so it puts that question out. And filtered water is literally then just a drop on the ocean. Mm -hmm. So any water that you, you know, Masaru Emoto's work showed that um, any water that you bless, that you pray to, that you put a positive word on for long enough, can actually change its energy. It doesn't mm. change its chemistry, but yeah. it changes its energy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I saw the guy from Brazil, the uh, Miracle Man. Yeah. He came to Sydney. What's his name again? Oh, I, oh. I forget it. But uh, Carlo something, he came and he brought his water, and I bought a whole case of blessed water. <laughs> and um, yeah, same same concept. It's it, it's it's beautiful. Um, Get alkaline water, really yeah, get good yeah. quality water, yeah. something yeah. like a pH perfect, yeah. like some, some of these really beautiful waters, drink coconut water, but mm. please don't drink tap water, um, yeah. and if you drink tap water, run it through an osmosis or something, yeah. Yeah. Um, get rain water and filter that, you yeah. know? Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about the conception and the beautiful um, process that that goes through. Can we talk a little bit about pregnancy and what happens in pregnancy? What does the baby go through consciously, and then what happens if a baby chooses to to pass away or, or doesn't 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 live its its nine months that of that contract? <laughs> what what does that mean? What that is a very very big journey. That's actually nearly ex that that's exploding the show because that's a very individual journey, 
and an individual soul contract and that's something to unlock with um, a therapist yeah. to really understand what was this contract what was the gift because I I believe every single journey holds a gift we just got to find it mm -hmm. and we just got to unlock it and we can when we can unlock that gift in that journey it um, the grief moves into gratitude right wow right like we can change our whole experience of life and experience of the situation mm -hmm. when we unlock the gift mm -hmm. of the most devastating um, life experiences and I've helped women and men through processes of unlocking that gift mm -hmm. of whether it's miscarriage or stillborn which you know you'll never not feel grief for the lost expectations and the lost dreams but when you understand the soul contract that's set there for the experience gifted on both sides a new understand it opens your mind your heart to new possibilities and it's like a veil was taken off that was wearing very very difficult and hard right wow so do you coach um, clients through that process as yes. well? Yeah, yes, yes, okay. it's, it's part of the process yeah. in conception because it's a very important one. Mm. No one talks about yeah. mis miscarriage and stillbirth is so big and it, it happens and all the time. Yeah, it's very, right. very common, yeah. So, okay, so we're moving, and so it, let's just say it does go the contract of 10, 10 months. What, what happens inside the body? What, what like, I did yoga, I did Bikram yoga the whole time, and I really think that that really had effect on Emily because she didn't cry. She's chilled out baby. She's so chilled. It, it has, it, look, it has a huge impact. Um, again, it's, it's really important in our society, right? I actually really want to go into that. Our society right now isn't prepared to be parents. We see what we see on TV. We see what we see with friends when we visit them, but we are not involved. 24-7 in their pregnancy anymore, 24-7 in their birth experience anymore, how it used to be either in tried or extended families with previous generations. So we're disconnected from the reality of pregnancy and birth, right, which causes us to have an image of what of pregnancy, what birth is, what parenthood is, and we're not prepared really for what's really going to happen. And then we hand over our power to everyone else, mm -hmm. the disempowering starts and we feel disconnected from the process and again postnatal depression can set in. Yeah, okay. um, if we begin a preconception journey with a real strong connection to the spirit and in the preconception journey we actually deal with all the fears of pregnancy and birth, by the time we are pregnant we don't have to mm. deal with those fears. Yeah. Because what science has shown now is mm. when we hold a lot of fear in our pregnancy um, our heart rate goes up, right? We have a lot more cortisol running through our body, which means the stress hormone runs through our mm. body. Science has actually proven that teenagers of depressed and high anxiety moms have had higher cortisol levels than um, their peers. So if a mother went through intense trauma mm. and didn't have the tools to handle it in her pregnancy, that child will have higher cortisol levels and is more likely to experience high emotional stress and stress-related, emotional-related um, issues in their lives. Mm -hmm. So it's actually when we learn the tools of mindfulness and mm -hmm. presence and connection, preconception, when trauma hits in pregnancy, we can handle it better and it prepares us for dealing with um, the postnatal experience. Like, I was caught in a fire in an apartment building in Jakarta when I was six weeks pregnant, right? I was caught in the staircase, I couldn't get out, smoke was everywhere. I ended up having to run up 40, 41st floor until I found a door opening up. I got out and I had to take the lift down. It was an uh, experience of 45 minutes, wow. which could have meant extreme trauma. But because of my tools of constantly checking in with baby, wow. constantly checking in with spirit, wow. constantly, I was actually rather calm in that situation and I had tools to handle this traumatic experience throughout the pregnancy 
and I could tap into that tool during birth and in the postnatal time. Wow. You know, so it works, but it's important if we want to be able to manage traumatic events you have no influence over in pregnancy and you don't want that stress, that cortisol to run through mm. your body, mm. then start preconception. And what you do affects what you do preconception affects your whole pathway and the way it sets up that child. So when you're saying um, that you're going to address your fears prior to pregnancy, you would say, okay, if any situation happens where you know I'm in flight or flight mode, I'm going to handle it in a calm way. So, yeah. so you just go through every single fear, and so that if that fear plans out, you already have in your head. You have a tool. You need an yeah. activator. When you yeah. know what your activator is, you just activate and you channel yeah. it easier. You know, when you have that connection with that child spirit and you just check in with that, when you have an understanding of connecting to your body, you know, you, you have something there. It, it is so profound what you have as a tool that you can use. You also have to face all your hidden fears and blocks of pregnancy and birth to actually fall pregnant. But can you talk about some of those hidden fears? I mean, obviously I, the fear of having birth is a big one, but yeah. what other fears? Um, I mean, it is um, fear of pain, it's fear of losing oneself, fear of the sacrifice, fear of losing yourself. We're so geared to be achievers. Um, so the fear of self-sacrifice is actually huge, um, beyond the fear of... Um, yeah, of, of the birth, of the pain of birth, fear of not being a good mom, fear of not being able to handle the situations, fears of becoming like your parents and handling stressful situations like your parents. There's like, the list is endless with which what is in there. It's unique to you. So it's something that you gotta actually unlock within you. So I can't tell you what it is. I can help you to unlock it yourself, <laughs> but I can't actually tell you what it is. You got to tell it to yourself and mm. figure it out. Okay. And sometimes it's ancestral. Mm. So um, if the story of birth or the story of pregnancy or the story of, you know, the postnatal period has been similar across the lineages, it's really an embodied experience mm. because think about it this way. If a woman is pregnant with a girl, the girl forms all the cells that sh that turn into eggs one day, which means when I'm uh, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I imprinted 50% of the DNA of my grandchildren with my mental emotional body. Now this is freaking huge, okay? So when we have tools to actually deal with our mental emotional space and how to speak to that spirit in its embodiment process, so it's not locked into their tissue, this goes beyond us. This goes actually beyond myself and my journey. This actually starts looking at my children's journey and my children's children's journey. And it's actually also calling us all, like me included, like it calls us all into greater responsibility because this goes beyond you and your want, my and my want. Mm -hmm. You know, this is bigger than that. Yeah, I've gotten chills like five times since you've um, started talking. Come, come closer, a little bit closer. Just um, um, okay. So, gosh, we've just gone through a lot. So, we let's talk about during pregnancy. Yeah. What happens during pre pregnancy? Okay, water breaks. We're on the route to the hospital. We've got our tools. We're not going to freak out. We're not going to freak out. We will <laughs> freak out. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But so, what happens now? Um, are you there? Are you there? Uh, with uh, with some of my clients, I'm there. Yeah. So uh, it depends on. Oh, sorry. It's okay. I yeah. just want these. It, it depends see. on the contract I have with a particular yeah. client. Okay. Whether I'm just coaching them through the process or whether I'm, I'm actually their physical doula. Uh -huh. So if I'm their doula, I'm actually there way beyond. Like depending on how um, contractions are going, I'm actually there, um, the moment they feel something, I invite my clients to call me in earlier than, uh, possible, so the earlier the better, you okay. know, I'm happy to come there at their first, oh, I think something might happen, yeah. and just be there and support them if that's what they yeah. wish, yeah. and it's really, my role is not, it's really more a shadow player and, and supporting everyone to feel supported, so it's really about, empowering the dad that the dad knows how to support the wife if the dad chooses to be part of it mm. because unless the father is really prepped and I really want to speak to that guys um, 
since men have to come to birth, you know, it used to be women's business. Now we don't live in big families where all the women take care of each other anymore. So everyone expects their husband to come. And a lot of husbands want to come, which means the husbands need to be prepared because you're the gatekeeper. You're the protector of this woman in hospital and also at home, depending on what you choose. So you're the gatekeeper. So you need to know and be in absolute agreement with your wife, with your woman, know how to tune in and trust it. Because you're gonna be triggered. You're gonna be shit scared. You're gonna be really triggered by what you're gonna witness, okay? And can you hold your own? Can you make empowered decisions when your partner needs to just let go and not utilize her brain because we're gonna be very, very primal by the time mm. we have a baby. It's a very primal experience, a very spiritual, incredible experience, but it's very primal. And people generally find trauma with, with how primal it becomes, you mm. know? Um, yeah. And so does the birth, whether the birth is easy or hard, does that have an imprint on the child? And does that Every, everything from conception to the first seven years of the life of the child has a major imprint. Wow. Um, the birth has, but I feel the birth is the real co-creation and the birth is nearly, we have no control of the birth. Mm. We can do the most amazing prep mm -hmm. and the birth ends up uniquely with what is being called for. Yeah. Yeah. It's like there is no... There is no perfect birth. Yeah, yeah. It's it. Every birth is perfect, no matter how it ended up, because there's a gift, a gift of wisdom or a gift of um, strength. Or yeah, or and and also that whatever how we are born is templated into us, and it really sets us up for our path. Mm. And it's it's really interesting if you start doing rebirthing with clients, you actually notice how their birth has actually imprinted on them and has actually paved that pathway, wow. right? And that's what we're doing. We're paving the pathway for this embodied spirit. Mm. But the spirit nearly chooses its, its, its experience because it came here to experience something, mm. came here to have soul lessons too, mm. came here for a particular set. So there's no accident why we chose a genetic ancestral lineage. Mm. There's no accident why we have the birth we have. Mm. I feel there's something higher than that. But we as, as the human being, mm. so there's the soul aspect of what our soul chooses to experience in human form and how that pathway is led. But how can we make that an empowered experience versus a victimized experience mm. of trauma? Mm. That's the difference, right. okay? Yeah. So that's the difference we're talking here. And that changes whether we embody love or fear as well. Mm. You know, yeah. are we in love, are we in fear? Can we hold this? Can we find the gift? Mm. And so that's where the prep is so important. And that's where it's so important to, to have an empowered birth experience. Uh, it not a, uh, yeah, where, where you felt, you didn't hand it over, but you were part of your own birth, you know. Mm. It's very hard to put into words. Mm. And um, a lot of men experience trauma and postnatal depression and no one speaks about it. Wow. You know, there's the, the rise of the masculine experiencing postnatal depression is huge. I didn't know men had postnatal depression. Should we move on to this topic? Let's talk about what happens after the baby is born and the mom is feeling low. Now you're saying the dad can also feel low. Dad and can feel low. Wow, can we talk about the differences and why that's happening? And yeah, um, so if, if you think, like a lot of us are actually talking about the fourth trimester. Mm. So baby was nine months in your body. It felt all of your emotions. It felt your heartbeat. It hurt all that you did and suddenly it's out. So it wants to still feel you close. It's not used to being by itself. So it's very, it's nearly traumatic. It's like, oh my God, the soul suddenly is out and suddenly, you know, if you think about it, that baby never did a poo. Suddenly it feels poo and, and changes of clothing. Yeah. And it's quite an intense event for a child, you know, if you think about that. And for the mom, it's complete self-sacrifice. You know, she's got to deal with breastfeeding. She might not have ever looked really closely at how a child breastfeeds because you don't look at a boob of another woman, you know. It's a no-go. So women have become 
this uh, I, I can see a real um, confidence level there with breastfeeding and also that we don't ask for help enough mm -hmm. and there are a lot of elements so a woman goes through this whole stage of loss of identity um, that really sits there too because suddenly they don't exist anymore they, they they feed the baby they change the baby they're sleepless you know they their sense of belief who they are is gone mm. so but it's easier for them with the bonding with skin to skin with having that love fest to actually not want anything else mm. so if they have the right support and actually don't have to worry about household don't have to worry about Nitty gritty, don't have to worry about dealing with the dad or anything. If they literally can just sit bonding with the child, skin on skin, there is less traumatic experience. If they have the right support to handle, to know how to care for themselves, to have a fourth trimester in mm -hmm. which they're being cared for and their only wow. job is bonding. Yeah. Right? Which means it causes stress to the husband who the w woman is supported with their bonding, she, she had the baby feeling baby inside of her for nine months she had an easier transition she has a woman tribe that does a blessing way ceremony or baby shower for her like she's prepped she's you know she's actually ready to move into being the mother because she was the mother by the time she felt baby growing inside of her she's already the mother like for me any woman that has fallen pregnant that is whether it's a six-week pregnancy three months eight months that woman is a mother so the woman starts embodying the motherhood and the birth is just the last element of that. Whereas the dad is external to it. He goes through hormonal changes, just like the mom. So it is proven that they go through hormonal changes. But um, the dad doesn't have the same internal sensory experience. Mm. And so dad has to go from me world. I'm spending money on me. I'm doing my thing. I do my thing when I can to self-sacrifice mm -hmm. and suddenly the woman has fed him attention and suddenly there's zero attention on the dad and we can conceptualize it or we can yeah. philosophize it or mentally deal with it beforehand but fathers don't have the same support system no one talks mm -hmm. about it right everyone asks the mom how she's going mm -hmm. how the birth was and mm -hmm. how she feels with it no one asks the dad and the amount of dads with birth trauma because they felt they couldn't protect their women when something didn't go as planned. Mm -hmm. It's huge and there is no support system to hold the dad through that process and to actually talk about it and to actually, how is it for you? What is going on inside of you? What is your experience, you know? And that then filters into the relationship, you know? Everyone has to find their role. What is it to be a mom? What is it to be a dad? What is it to complete self-sacrifice yeah. for this being yeah. that needs your 100% yeah. attention? And you know, Can we talk about the relationship between the mother and the father and how that impacts the baby? Because, oh. you know, I mean, you want this baby to be in a loving relationship, but there's a lot of times the stress of having a newborn creates tension, creates anger, and that's the last thing yeah. that the baby wants to be feeling. That, that, so that's again, it brings me back to the importance of preconception work, because when we own, if we, have, if we hold emotional responsibility, right? If we understand mindfulness and emotional responsibility and take responsibility for our experience and learn how to communicate that, then any situation postnatally when we're stressed, when we're overwhelmed, when we don't feel um, held or whatever sits there mm. or we feel overwhelmed with lack of self or we're just emotional and we can't hold our self but we're easier in blame mode that's when tension is caused. Mm. Now a child for the first seven years of its life um, shares the energy field of its mother. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a sharing of the, of the chakra system, of the auric field, of the whole energetic field. So a child really feels very strongly the emotional body of a mother. So, and also again, breast milk is water, is holding memory. So if we're really emotional, and we have a massive tantrum or we're in anger and we feed that milk to the child mm -hmm. on an energetic level, 
that'll work itself. Mm. And the old saying, uh, uh, peaceful mom, peaceful baby, really is there. Mm. So how can we create a peaceful mom without negating her truthful emotions, mm. you mm. know, her, her state of truth? You know, and again, when we have tools of mindfulness and presence and hold our emotional responsibility of our experiences, mm -hmm. we can handle these situations and find ways to acknowledge each person's journey. This is not about compromising you for the other. This is about really loving you for you and really allowing your partner to love himself for him and actually owning what you need right now to and acknowledge we are currently going through a rite of passage. Mm. We have a loss of identity and we're currently rebuilding a new identity. So it's really, um, yeah. Sorry about that. You were in such flow and... Um, Oh my goodness. Okay, so can we just talk a little bit about you, what you were talking about, how the, the bond between the daughter and the mom stays with you until seven? Yeah. Can I just talk a little bit about a personal story? Yeah. Um, my relationship with my daughter is, is so strong and so beautiful and I love her so much. Um, and I made decisions at the beginning of my, my motherhood in my relationship. I knew that my vibration with my husband at the time was not what I wanted her to see and I made decisions and those decisions led to us not living a traditional mother-daughter life and it's something that I've had to get over because society puts roles and and, and um, you know stories around situations and so I've had to overcome some ego about this situation um, and it took me a little a hard time to to be okay as a mom to let the role of the mom on a day-to-day -day basis go mm -hmm. like I, I had to give up a little bit of myself to make the journey for my daughter smoother and and happier yeah and I, I just wonder what your thoughts are on that and and it's actually very common that things that we accepted in a partnership before no longer validate because we suddenly want to allow the child to have a healthy imprinting of what it is to be fully loved and fully accepted or whatever it is so it's very uncommon so conscious uncoupling which sounds like what you're doing is actually really the way forward because you are you are going through such a big struggle and, and, and your idea and a lot of women question these days is is this really what I want to teach my daughter mm. or my son that this is how a relationship needs to be mm -hmm. because we're imprinting how how you talk to your partner how he talks to you is the first story that a child subconsciously understands mm. with what it means to be loved by man and woman, yeah. what is respected, what is loved. And it, it's the first un subconscious understanding of, of that power or power struggle, however it's mm -hmm. held, mm -hmm. and what love is between two people. Yes. So it's, it subconsciously filters through. Um, and I feel uncoupling in a conscious way is really important. So I've seen a lot of beautiful, beautiful parents that managed again to hold personal responsibility for their experience, mm -hmm. yet give their child an incredible experience by owning their stuff and not letting that get in the way to being incredible parents for that child. Yeah. You know, and that sounds what like what you're doing. Yes, you are, yes. You're choosing to be a better parent for your child because a happy mom is a happy child yes. and if you're constantly unhappy, depressed and in trauma, what are you telling your child that, do you want your, okay the question is, do you want your child to be in a loving relationship when it's older? Do you want your child to think it's natural to be loved for who you are or to not be with someone? Or do you want the child to just sacrifice itself to be in a loving relationship, you know? Mm. And so if we 
if we can own that and still love the child and the child feels this has nothing to do with me this is their stuff but they love me enough to love me for who I am. Mm -hmm. So it's how we hold our emotional responsibility, mm -hmm. whether it imprints on a child or not. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh my gosh. I, I could talk to you forever. So let's talk about your business. Now that we have the foundation of what you are all about, Aparaba. Yeah. What is that? What is the name? What does the name mean? Where did it come from? And how did you get to this, this okay. business? Okay. So, a parava was a very long journey um, and a para is actually a Sanskrit term that sits for the hidden and lost chakra which is called um, which is basically the placenta so the placenta um, of a human being is really the blueprint of physical life on this earth plane so our whole blueprint while we're here on this earth plane sits in the placenta so it's a very sacred organ I could actually go on for hours on the importance of the placenta and returning placenta um, ceremony ownership and not putting it into the garbage to be honest um, it's so important to really own that because it holds the blueprint of while we're here and so the apara really talks about this tree of life of our current physical existence mm -hmm. Um, so it's basically it stands for life mm -hmm. but is um, I deeply deeply honor the um, the peoples of this land and their ancestors and everyone who's gone before us and in dialect um, not in every so in some Aboriginal dialects ba denotes place of in others it's more da or it, you know you can you can look it up but in some of the dialects ba is the denotation for place of and I am really really humbled and deeply respectful and honoring of the people of this land and their traditions mm -hmm. and also the sacred and ancient teachings that I had the privilege to witness and and receive over the years mm -hmm. and so for me it's an honoring to utilize that word ba as place of so really a parava is the place of life mm. okay a parava a parava dot com yeah dot au yeah. But uh, you, dot com dot com you you s okay so how does your business work and what kind of people do you work with and how can they get hold of you and yeah because there's a lot of listeners from the U S and the U K and around the world that yeah. that can benefit from your coaching and your training and your, your wisdom. Yeah. How do they get a hold of you? So basically, um, uh, several things. So Conscious Conception is actually available um, either via mobile phone app for iPhone or via Teachable, so as an online workshop. And they can then choose whether they want to journey with me with some private sessions or whether they just want to do it as a standalone and just reach out when they need to. It, it works standalone, but I think there are certain elements within that journey um, that might trigger you uh, because sometimes we feel resistance or sometimes a traumatic experience is awakened that needs healing uh, to remove the block. And so in those moments, I ask for them to really connect with mm -hmm. me, for me to hold in a private session that can be over Zoom or whatever. Yeah. Um, Conscious Birth is currently just my doula service and workshops that... I co-created with a divine, amazing woman, Alicia Sharples. She's an incredible storyteller and um, intuitive artist. And so we're currently filming the conscious birth component for online, uh, but we're available for physical, um, physical workshops. Conscious Birth is actually going to come to Scotland as a seven-day intensive program where we're going to walk the medicine wheel to access the ancient technology of uh, the medicine wheel, your chakra system, and really, really engage with calling in that spirit and allowing it a journey to embodiment by, you know, lifting some of those hidden blocks that we don't know there are. And so, yeah, so I'm available online and at the Fintorn Foundation in November. So maybe you want to check it out. Is that the Scotland? Fin That's Okay, Scotland. so let's just talk a little bit about that. Where is that? What is that? And um, So oh, the Fintorn Foundation is just an incredible place in the world. Um, 
the way that was conceived was really like what I'm teaching about conscious conception. They made contact with spirit, spirit told them basically where to plant what plants. So they basically allowed the plants and the earth to tell them where to plant them and out of a small sandy and gravel camping place, you know, there's now a forest and gardens and this incredible landscape and it's a spiritual educational charity that has been there for decades and it's just this oh I could cry about because it's so magical and you walk through and you're like wow all they did they listened to spirit they trusted in the messages and they follow up. And that's why I love holding conscious conception there mm. because conscious conception is the same thing. Yeah. I assist you to opening the channel, to listen to spirit and to act up on it, to help embodying that spirit child. Mm. So it's just the most amazing space in the world to hold this. Wow. Wow. You know, and it's happening on the 18th of November right. in Scotland. Awesome, yeah. great. Okay, so just one last question. The types of people that should get in touch with you, anybody that's thinking about pregnancy, anybody that's having a hard time with pregnancy, anybody that's pregnant? Um, yeah, so uh, anyone who's pregnant, I'm happily supporting you either in your uh, prenatal and postnatal journey, whether it's through Skype and Zoom or whether it's uh, physically, so just get in touch. Yeah. Um, I'm very, very passionate about supporting women and men on this journey. And for the um, conception work, anyone, whether you've, you're, you're literally just young and think at some point I want to explore having a child or whether you've gone eight years through IVF without results, what this journey is actually doing. I call it a journey because trying to conceive is another stress. It is, if we have a goal on this, it increases the stress that we're holding in our body because when we are having achievement energy, we're masculine, we're trying to achieve, we're, we're goal getting, which holds stress in the body. Now stress reduces your fertility by 40%. Wow. Right? So I call it a journey to not have a goal of time and place, but actually allowing it to unfold and have an empowered experience mm -hmm. through it. Okay, so yeah, so that journey is for anyone who, who really wants to have an empowered, connected experience with journeying into parenthood at some point, really. Wow. Esther, you've given me chills like 10 times this conversation. Oh, I thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and telling us about a parabola. And yeah, listeners from around the world, anybody that's thinking about having a baby or who is already pregnant, I would highly suggest that you reach out to Esther. You're a wealth of information and beauty, and uh, I mean, I, I, I could, I have more questions. We're gonna have to bring you back onto the show. <laughs> Happy to. Meet. Yeah. So that's gonna conclude our wellness radio for today, and um, I'm just gonna sign off by saying thank you again, Esther, and I hope you have a great weekend. You've flown from the Sunshine Coast. It's not so sunny here today in Bondi, but <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. Thank you for having me. All right, listeners and viewers, thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend, and um, we'll see you next time. Bye for now.